please turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 23, verses 13 through 39 is this morning's text. <clears throat> Matthew 23, verses 13 through 39. It's a long one, guys, so pay attention. We'll, we'll be reading through it together, and then I'll make a couple remarks. <clears throat> Verse 13, I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. Verse 13, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people. For you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers. Therefore you will not receive excuse me, you will receive greater condemnation. Verse 15, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, whoever swears by the temple, that is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple, that is obligated. You fools and blind men, which is more important, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, that is nothing. But whoever swears by the offering on it, he is obligated. You blind men, which is more important, the offering or the altar that sanctifies the offering? Therefore, whoever swears by the altar swears both by the altar and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple, swears both by the temple and by him who dwells within it. And whoever swears by heaven, swears both by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Verse 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish, so that the outside of it may become clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, For you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partners with them in the shedding of blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of hell? Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, so that upon you may fall all the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills prophets and stones those who were sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together, the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate, for I say to you, from now on, You will not see me until the day you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. 
It is a hard word, (laughs) but is necessary and good. And Lord, we pray that you would help us examine our own hearts as we reflect upon it, that we would rejoice in the saving kindness and mercy of Jesus Christ, and that we would commit ourselves fully and wholly to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I just want to officially extend my congratulations and well wishes to the bride and groom, Hannah and Ben. Uh, It was great. Uh, It was just a great privilege to be a part of uh, part of the ceremony yesterday and serve, Um, and it was a joy to celebrate Ben and Hannah's marriage as we reflected on a greater marriage. I love just how gospel-centered the ceremony was, and it really helped me just think about, wow, that day's coming when Christ will return. It was so, Ben and Hannah, if you're watching, thank you. That was a just very edifying ceremony. Uh, We've reflected deeply on the greater marriage in which every marriage, theirs included, will only ever be a shadow. That was actually part of their vows. Super cool. And so thinking about this made me hungry for heaven. It may be some wedding cake, but it made me hungry for heaven, hungry for Christ's return. And, you know, however glorious yesterday was, and it was, it was a glorious day, its glory will pale in comparison to the marriage supper of the Lamb. What a great day that's going to be! Man, I'm looking forward to that. And as we prayed about this morning, yes, may that be this year, today. But, you know, we, we mustn't forget that that day will also be a terrible day. Glorious for those who have been gathered by Jesus, but terrible for those who have stood in opposition to him. And as I introduced last week, this morning's passage in all of chapter 23 is the second of a two-part climax in which Jesus here is publicly denouncing the religious leaders, namely the scribes and the Pharisees, who set themselves against God while presuming to be ambassadors for God. This morning, through a series of seven woes, Jesus is calling us, I think, to examine our hearts. Indeed, because Jesus Christ is our risen King and coming Judge, examine your heart and entrust it fully to His saving and sending arms. Because Jesus Christ is our risen King and coming judge, examine your heart and entrust it fully to his saving and sending arms. Before we jump in, just have a couple preliminary notes. Just want to make sure you guys are aware of so we're not kind of caught off guard here. First thing I want to share with you guys is how this passage is set up. It's going to help you understand my flow, because <laughs> if we're, gonna, we're not going to go verse by verse, well, we are going verse by verse, but we're doing it out of order, um, purposely, okay? And that's because these seven woes are set up in a, what's called a chiasm, okay? It's a chiastic structure. Go ahead. Why don't you put it on the screen? You can see it here. They're going to work on that, and they'll put it on the screen when they're ready. Oh, there it is. Okay, I know the letters, or the font may be a little small, but um, here's how it's set up. You can see here, you've got A, B, C, D, and then C prime, B prime, A prime. It's a little cut off there, but it's kind of like an X, or the Greek chi, okay? It's an X here, and as you move in, you get kind of to the heart of the matter, Okay? So you start, and you can see here that they mirror the, the top two, or the top and the bottom are the same. You move in, they're the same, you keep, and then that, that's a chiasm, okay? There's probably a technical definition, but we're not, I'm not going not gonna to do that. Um, there it is, okay? They failed to recognize those sent from God. They were super, 
superficially zealous, but did more harm than good. They misused scripture, and then they failed to discern the thrust of scripture. And that's really the heart of it. And that's actually where we're going to start, and then we'll move backward. Um, hopefully this makes sense. I will give you guys, there will be scripture uh, verses up there so you can, you, you'll be able to track along, but we're going to start actually at the heart of the matter and then move our way outward this morning. So just want to make you aware of that. The second thing is if you were um, maybe studious, and I'm not quite sure what kind of, what Bible version you have, but you're like, hey, wait, Pastor Nick, you missed a woe. There should be eight woes. Um, verse 14 I read it this morning in the New American Standard, and if you have an NAS, it's bracketed. And it's bracketed because it's, it, the, the editors are telling us this verse likely wasn't original to the Gospel of Matthew. It was a later insertion. They weren't totally, they didn't just make this up. It's found in Mark 12 and in the Gospel of Luke. So uh, I think they, we're not sure exactly what happened, but somewhere along the way it got mixed up and put in here probably on accident, unintentionally, okay? Uh, so I am not going to comment on verse 14. It's probably better that we just read 13 and then 15 and kind of go on from there. So you'll no notice that. That's intentional. I didn't, didn't forget it. Don't worry. Um, the other thing I just want to note here that woes think of, sometimes some people say, woe is me, right? You can use woe, that term, in a sense that's kind of like, you know, lamenting, feeling bad for yourself. That's not what Jesus is doing here. I mean, hopefully that's very clear from what we read this morning already. These woes are condemning in nature. He is condemning the scribes and the Pharisees. And sometimes it just doesn't rub people the right way, um, ironically, because they have fallen into the very same trap the Pharisees did. If we think Jesus is just love and peace and rainbows and bunnies, we are going to miss the gospel of Jesus Christ, okay? We can't do that. We need to hear and reflect on the hard things Jesus has to say in this text and, and elsewhere, it's important that we understand all of Scripture, okay? Not just the, the parts we like, not that just the parts that make us feel good. Uh, so this, this is kind of this whole, you know, the, the text today. Um, there, there is gold here that's worth preaching and teaching and reflecting on. All of God's Word is God-breathed and useful. And so we're going to be doing that today, although sometimes you got to dig a little deeper. Um, so just kind of, those are preliminary comments I want to make on these verses, and we'll jump right in. And gen broadly, we've got kind of two sections here. We, we, we'll see this morning both the nature and consequence, both the nature and the consequence of the Pharisees' failure. So we'll We'll unpack that. What is the nature of their failure? And that's what these seven woes are about. So the first piece here, which is D, letter D, but I've got here up on the screen. Number one, they failed to discern the thrust of Scripture. They failed to understand what God's Word is all about. Verses 23 and 24, you can read that with me. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. This verse, these verses really get at the heart of the issue for the scribes and the Pharisees. It's not that everything they did was wrong. These Pharisees were so careful that they even tithed garden herbs. Right? That's what this is saying here. <laughs> and yet, even in their most careful attempts to fulfill some of the law, they failed. They failed. Again, not because the right things they were doing were wrong, right? but because their fixation on the minors caused them to miss the majors. 
their failure to discern the true thrust of the scriptures meant that they missed the most important aspects or the weightier provisions of the Mosaic law. They majored on the minors, and they minored on the majors. Or as Jesus put it, they strained out a fly, but swallowed a camel. Both of these are unclean animals. You're not supposed to eat these, but yeah, they were great. They got the gnat out, right? Got the fly out. That's no good. But you're kind of missing it if you're eating camel, guys. And that's exactly what they were doing. If anyone should be able to strain out a camel, okay, if anyone should be able to understand justice, mercy, and faithfulness, you'd think it would be the people who tithe from their personal gardens. And yet they didn't. They totally missed the thrust of the scriptures. Do you see the tragic irony here? What's more, I don't think they ever saw how hypocritical they were being. I'm pretty sure they were totally convinced that they really understood good God's word, okay? Well enough to presume to sit on the seat of Moses, like we talked about last week. And that's a really sobering thought. I was thinking about that this week. Pharisaical hypocrisy didn't necessarily come from a mind that was set on deception. I don't think they were trying to do, to pull a fast one on people necessarily. It didn't come from a mind set on deception, but from a deceived mind. We need to get God's word right. We need to be people who major on the majors and minor on the minors. Minors are important. They're good, but they're not the majors, and vice versa. Our feet need to be firmly planted on the gospel of Christ. Otherwise, we are liable to fall into the same ditch of hypocrisy as the Pharisees. Having fallen into this hypocritical ditch, the Pharisees not only misunderstood Scripture, they also misused it as well. So now we're moving out here. The misuse of Scripture in verses 16 through 22 and 25 through 26. And we'll read 16 through 22 together. Woe to you blind guides who say, whoever swears by the temple, that is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple is obligated. You fools and blind men, which is more important, the gold or the temple that is sanctified, or that sanctified the gold? And whoever swears by by the altar, that is nothing, but whoever swears by the offering on it, he is obligated. You blind men, which is more important, the offering or the altar that sanctifies the offering? Therefore, whoever swears by the altar, swears both by the altar and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple, swears both by the temple and by him who dwells within it. And whoever swears by heaven, swears both by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. All right, without getting too bogged down by the details here, it's important to note that Jesus' main point here is very simple. So don't miss this. The main point, tell the truth. I know, crazy, very controversial, but that's, the, that's what Jesus was getting at. Tell the truth. Scholars believe that ger- during Jesus' day, the Pharisees tried to combat, actually, tried to combat common abuses of oath-taking by differentiating between which elements of the temple were binding and which were not. Right? I'm going to swear by this element of the temple and that means I'm obligated to it, or if I say this, but I, it sounds good, but I'm not actually obligated because it's not really a temple ornament or what have you. In this case, temple gold, altar offering are the main um, examples that Jesus is talking about here. See, this formal and man-made designation of binding and non-binding temple elements actually led to deceptive oath-taking, and encourage lying, right? Oh, well, this is binding, this isn't, and, but maybe not everyone knows that, so I'm going to say this, and 
That way I can kind of get out of it. I don't really have to take my promise seriously. I don't actually have to deliver. Jesus is saying here, all oaths are binding. All vows should be fulfilled. Tell the truth. We should be men and women of our word. We shouldn't try to find easy outs in the commitments we make. Pharisees, you think you're helping clear the air about oaths? You're not. You're blind because you fail to see what's important in Scripture. And so you misuse the Scriptures you misunderstand. Verses 25 and 26 follow a similar vein here. 25 and 26. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup of the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. Their misuse of Scripture is also evident here, albeit metaphorically. I think that's important. These verses aren't about ceremonial cleanliness of dishware, right? But about the moral cleanliness of the soul. The Pharisees' misunderstanding and subsequent misuse of Scripture may have led them to carefully observe external rituals, such as cleaning dishes in a certain way, but it also led them into moral bankruptcy, Were the provisions for ceremonial cleansing in the, were there provisions for ceremonial cleansing in the Mosaic law? Of course, Ex- absolutely. And they were very sure to follow them. Could these provisions somehow cleanse or offset inward sin? No, they can't. The Pharisees misunderstood Scripture, which resulted in their misuse of Scripture. And this, in turn, led to the harming of those in their care. This is the the third point here, the third failure. They were superficially zealous, but did more harm than good. So we're moving out again here. Now we're in verses 15 and 27 through 28. Start with verse 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Contrary to Jewish teaching today, winning converts or proselytizing was a key feature of Judaism in Jesus' day. Today, today, Jews don't really do the proselytizing thing. They're actually against that, but that was actually a a major, not a major, but a, a, you know, a significant uh, part of Judaism in Jesus' day. Whether they were winning pagans, Gentile sympathizers to Judaism, or even other Jews to their own particular faction or position, the Pharisees in in this time made fairly zealous missionaries. And notice that Jesus uh, does not correct them for proselytizing. Instead, he corrects them because of what became of those who were won over by the Pharisees. They became twice as much sons of hell. (laughs) Why? Well, because the trajectory of Pharisaical, and by the way, all man-made religion, leads away from the true religion of Jesus Christ. The more you add to God's word, as the Pharisees did, the further away from God you end up. And that's exactly what was happening here. The Pharisees were zealous, yes, But their zeal didn't help others live Godward lives of obedience. It prevented them from receiving God's word written properly, receiving God's word written, and receiving God's word incarnate, Jesus Christ. 
verses 27 through 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Something I actually learned this week, I didn't know this, is that whitewash was used not merely as, a, uh, as an ornamentation on graves or tombs, but as a warning sign. As pilgrims would make their way up to Jerusalem everywhere, every year for Passover, and by the way, Jesus is teaching during that week of Passover, right? As pilgrims made their way up to Jerusalem, it was important that the travelers maintain their ritual purity so that they could partake in the holiday's ceremonies. If they became unclean, they'd be disqualified. Whitewash served as a critical, served a critical purpose, and that was to warn passers-by that unclean burial sites were ahead so that they could be avoided. In effect, Jesus is condemning the Pharisees by comparing them with tombs whose showy appearance should re- be regarded not as a sign of righteousness, but as a warning. Emulating pharisaical zeal won't lead to piety, true piety. It will only lead to uncleanness and ultimately will be disqualifying for God's people. That's what Jesus is getting at here. So in this way, too, the Pharisees were superficially zealous, looked like they had zeal on the outside, but in effect did more harm in their zeal than they did good. The last failure of the Pharisees in these verses is that they failed to recognize those sent from God. Verse 13, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people. For you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. If misunderstanding the thrust of God's word represents the heart of pharisaical failure, not recognizing those sent from God represents the pinnacle of their failure. At first glance, 13 doesn't look like a verse about failing to recognize those sent from God, but remember what it means to shut off and enter into the kingdom of heaven according to the parable of the two sons earlier in Matthew 21. One son, if you remember, played lip service to the father's instruction, right? Father told him to do something, and he said, sure, but didn't end up following through. He flaked out, right? The other son initially refused his father to his face, (laughs) but ultimately responded positively, obeying the father's command, which did the father's will. Well, the son that followed through. Jesus says in response, or in light of this parable, let me turn here to verse 31. Which of the two did the will of the Father, Jesus says? They said, the first. Jesus said, said to them, truly I say to you that the tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. For you come, or excuse me, for John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did believe him, and you, seeing this, did not even feel remorse afterward so as to believe him. Do you hear the similarity? Jesus is saying the same thing here as he did in. Uh, Same thing in in this parable as he does in 23, verse 13. The religious leaders did not believe John and his message, which, by the way, is the same message of Jesus. Consequently, 
but they do not enter into the kingdom. The Pharisees' opposition to Christ and his forerunner, John, effectively shuts off the messianic kingdom from their, themselves and their disciples. They keep others from entering and, they, and themselves do not enter the messianic kingdom because they fail to recognize those who have been sent by God. Verses 29 and 32 basically say the same thing. <clears throat> Verse 29, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we'd been living in the days of our fathers, we wouldn't have been partners with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers. The Pharisees honor dead prophets as heroes by decorating their tombs, but they are self-deceived, believing that they are more righteous than the ones who put them in the very graves they decorate. Jesus does not mince words here. You are sons of those who murdered the prophets, he says, and not just in the physical sense. You not only share in the genetics of your murderous forefathers, you will surely share in the murderous legacy of your forefathers as well. Verse 32 is both defiant and, again, a tad sarcastic. <laughs> Make your bed and lie in it, he says. Not exactly, that's my paraphrase, but essentially what's he saying here. Make your bed and lie in it. D.A. Carson writes, God can only tolerate so much sin. When the measure is full, he must respond with wrath. Earlier references to this, this idea of um, filling up for yourselves wrath <clears throat> Or were applied to Gentiles, to pagan nations and people, uh, not to Israel, not to Jewish leaders, but that's exactly how Jesus is using it here. You see, guys, the Pharisees have failed, and they failed in catastrophic ways. Jesus responds to the failures, these failures by condemning them for not discerning the thrusts of Scripture, for misusing Scripture, for doing more harm by their superficial zeal, and lastly, for not recognizing those sent from God. And now the second part here is the consequence of their failure, and that's what the rest of these verses are about. It reaches, the condemnation of Jesus reaches its climax, its apex, as he announces the severe consequences of the Pharisees' failure. Uh, the first one is the filling up of their guilt, verses 33 to 36. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of hell? Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel, to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Though they go to great lengths to maintain an external righteousness, these murderous whitewashed tombs are actually descendants of the ancient serpent in whose fate they will also share. Pharisaical hypocrisy and rebellion is nothing new. It's an ancient foe that looks righteous on the outside, but in reality stands in op opposition to the things of God and to the people of God. And this is why the Lord sends you and me into the mission field. This is why he sends us. In order to be scourged and killed and persecuted, Will you go? Will you send others into that kind of mission field? That's what Jesus is talking about here. These prophets, scribes that go to these people who oppose them, 
That will be his church. Missions is dangerous, but its end is glorious. It's glorious because by it we see people from every tribe and tongue and language enter into the messianic kingdom by grace and through faith in the risen king. But missions is also glorious because gospel proclamation condemns those destined for destruction. And we don't know who's, gonna, who's destined to embrace or oppose the Messiah and his kingdom people, but we do know that there is purpose in every persecution, purpose in sustaining those who experience it, and purpose in filling up almighty wrath against those who persecute God's elect. And as a result of their failures, these religious people, the religious leaders are filling up guilt for themselves for Judgment Day. Unfortunately, their actions are not theirs only, but are representative of the nation as a whole, over which Jesus laments in 37 through 39. Jesus' focus, Jesus' focus broadens now to the whole of Jerusalem, which here is representative of the nation as a whole. Can you hear the anguish in Jesus' words? How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. No mere prophet can say that. Only the Savior of Israel can long for that, can say that. And that's exactly who Jesus is. Yet Israel's hard-heartedness and rebellion has led Jesus to consign the nation and her temple to desolation and destruction. Though verse 39 seems a bit confusing, for I say to you from now on, and you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Wait, didn't they just say that? Right? Wasn't that just Palm Sunday? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord? Well, not exactly. The phrase from now until is connected later with the eschaton, the end times, Christ's return in judgment. In effect, Jesus is saying, one, that his handing over of Jerusalem to destruction will be in conjunction with his earthly departure. He's leaving them, consigning them over. And second, that he's coming back. And when he does, all will acknowledge him. Which brings us back full circle, you guys. Jesus, the risen king, is coming back. And when he does, the humble will be exalted, and the exalted will be brought low. When he returns, all all will surely recognize his appearing, but not all will rejoice in it. For some those whom Jesus has gathered, Jesus' Jesus is returning will be a glorious day, but for others it will be horrifying. Which will it be for you? Jesus Christ is our risen King and coming Judge. Examine your heart and entrust it fully to his saving and sending arms. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. And we pray, Lord, that you would give us grace today to examine and see our own hypocrisy through the lens of your word that we may repent and turn from it. Lord, there's no freedom, there's no way to have freedom to come in to you by faith apart from your grace. So, Lord, would you do that in our hearts today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.